Hello, this is Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo again. I'm a psychiatrist specializing in eating disorders in Long Island, New York. Uh, this is just a quick update uh, that I wanted to discuss with everyone out there who treats eating disorders in the hopes that uh, it'll help you with your patients as well as uh, maybe keep track some, for some data so we better understand this as time goes on. I just wanted to go over that right now in my current outpatient practice, and again, I do specialize in eating disorders, so I have probably over 300 active cases. I have uh, seven confirmed cases of patients with eating disorders. That means they've tested positive, two with anorexia nervosa, two with uh, otherwise specified feeding and eating disorder, which is more of an atypical anorexia, BMI is greater than 17, and a bulimia nervosa, a little bit more closely resembling purging disorder and three patients with binge eating disorder. Now, of these cases, the anorexia cases, I had, they're age 22 and 32, mild fatigue, loss of smell. There was no temperature, again, with these patients. It really was the loss of smell that helped uh, kind of direct them in the direction that they may be positive. There was no hospitalizations, although one did go to the emergency room briefly for some mild respiratory distress, but, but was sent home and has gone through some significant discuff, uh, discomfort, but uh, overall has been doing fairly well and hopefully will soon recover fully. With the uh, OSFED cases, again, ages 22 and 29, uh, a little bit more symptomatic actually, a lot of fatigue, there was some shortness of breath, especially with one patient, some low grade fever, one got as high as 99.0, seven, the other one was about 100.2. Uh, there was a lot of muscle aches and pains, kind of uh, flu-like symptoms. Uh, there was a loss of smell again in one of those patients. They had some low uh, pulse ox readings, uh, close to 90%. Neither one was hospitalized. One again had an ER visit and was placed on the hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax combination through the ER. The uh, binge eating cases, I've had again three patients. The um, older patient at 54 years old did have uh, underlying diabetes and some uh, hypertension. Uh, they did uh, have a little bit higher fever. They actually got as high as close to 104 with their fever. And they had again the flu-like symptoms, some moderate short shortness of breath, pulse oximetry again approached 90 percent may have dipped slightly below at that at one point um, and we also had the uh, 24 year old patient with uh, asthma which is usually mostly exercise induced uh, so did have some increased shortness of breath and worries and concern but there were no ho hospitalizations one of the patients again was placed on the hydroxychloroquine seems to be responding to that and shortening her illness so hopefully of all my cases that at least I'm working with uh, there's been nothing serious as far as needing to go to the ICU or anything, although uh, two are pretty much recovered or near recovery, and the other five are kind of in the middle of it at this point. I did want to mention here that uh, if you have patients with eating disorders, it might be helpful if you start kind of keeping a little notebook or side book to kind of track all this. It's, it's easy to get caught, caught up in all the uh, busyness and commotion of what's going on right now, but kind of collecting some of this data might pr prove useful both to yourself and to others in the field and maybe for some future data research that uh, I'd, I'd especially be interested in if towards the end of all this uh, some people sent me some information again without uh, disclosing any patient identifying information of course. I, I just put a little chart here of something you might consider where you have the date, the patient name, maybe their diagnosis, uh, uh, temperature, pulse ox, respiratory rates, heart rate, blood pressure, if they go for testing, when did they go, what was the results of that, and some of the symptoms and comments they may have when you see the patients. Of course, if you're a clinician, a therapist, or a nutritionist, you can modify some of this, but it might be helpful uh, to collect the data and, and have that as well as it may be useful to somebody in the future because I think our, our patient population uh, isn't being tracked and looked at specifically. So the more of us out there that can kind of do this, maybe we can find some way to put this together in conferences, lectures, and papers in the future.
I did come up with a mnemonic of questions you want to ask when it comes to trying to identify symptoms. And again, I think this is not this is not just for physicians and nurse practitioners, nurses, and other medical personnel, but these types of questions uh, can equally be beneficial for those in uh, a therapeutic setting and in a nutritional setting, just to help everyone out there with surveillance and guidance. And the mnemonic I came up with was uh, stop COVID for self, sisters, brothers, and family. And it's the first letter. Um, as you'll see, I got seven symptoms, seven questions that I think are great to ask. The first being, do you feel sick? Okay, um, is, 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 are you feeling achy, tired, fatigued? Uh, is it unusual? Is this sickness something different than you've been feeling before? The C is for any cough, okay? Uh, again, you can ask if it's a different type of cough, and people at this time of year may be saying, yes, I have some allergies and everything, and, but still, that C is, again, another potential red flag, and these are seven red flags. Um, the F is, uh, have you ever felt a fever? And chills go with it, and the, as I mentioned in a prior video, you know, sometimes with cases like with anorexia nervosa, you want to differentiate cold intolerance and chills, and fever and chills can be very common. And we're usually missing that uh, fever response in anorexia nervosa. So these seven types of symptoms can really help with that patient population. Are there any stomach upset, GI upset, complaints, diarrhea? Uh, initially, they thought it, there, wouldn't be, there wasn't too much reported in China with this, but many people are now reporting this as one of the initial symptoms. So you want to ask if, if anything's new as far as uh, their stomach being upset and diarrhea. Is there any difficult with breathing lately? Are they having more shortness of breath, whether it's at rest or on exertion? Are there any ch change or loss in smell? And usually with smell goes a, a change or a loss in taste. And smell can be a key identifying factor. Again, many clinicians look at if you lose your sense of smell, that's almost a positive test right there for COVID-19. And is anyone in your family sick? Um, with those seven patients I've had, all, six of them, the people in their household, eventually all tested positive also. So, you know, if they may not have symptoms, they may not uh, test positive right now, but if they're living in a family household with people who are positive, that's gonna be a great risk factor. Of course, if they're answering some of these questions positively and everything, you wanna make sure to ask them, have you called or notified your doctor? and let that doctor make that decision of what they want to do next based on the CDC and WHO guidelines. And again, just another mention, especially for working with our patient with eating disorders, maybe now more than ever, the, the saying, vitamin F is your medicine, uh, it, and it is in this case. It's, it's the food, the vitamins, everything we need is really to help stand there and protect uh, our immune system and let the immune system do its job to the best that it can. Um, especially right now, uh, without giving specifics, I know a lot of vitamin C is sometimes being um, recommended, zinc supplementation. The other thing that's being noted is with self-isolation and people staying inside so much, uh, there may be some uh, worsening of vitamin D uh, in patients, which has always been a problem before all of this. So. So, you know, you want to work with your nutritionist, your doctor to make sure that uh, everything is, uh, at least for, uh, for the sake of the immune system, being taken care of from, from a vitamin-wise as well as from a total nutritional perspective. So, again, that's just an update. I'm hoping everybody at least will try to keep track of their patients, keep asking good questions that are important to ask, even if you're in the middle of a therapy session, whether you do it towards the beginning, which might be better than doing it towards the end in case you have to explore a little bit more. Same thing with nutritionists. Help, help everybody. Everybody in the field right now has to you know, keep a high level of uh, surveillance and detection open so that we can help control this. Uh, make sure you're all taking the necessary precautions that you need to do, wear a mask, social distancing, distancing and all of that. And again, I just want to thank you for this short video update from the last one. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, we do have a video on 
the evidence-based concerns on infection, disease, immune function, malnutrition, and eating disorders, as well as uh, the paper that I have that anyone who wants it could send me a copy of email. I've also posted that on LinkedIn as well, both the video and the paper, and the video is on YouTube. So this is Dr. DeSarbo, um, hoping everybody stays safe and healthy and vigilant for our patients. Thank you.